We've gone ahead and uh, just done another test power up. We haven't finished it off, but we've gone ahead and actually connected all of the at least initial uh, chassis fans as well as the CPU water cooling solution. And so this is a good time once again before you put everything on. What we want to now do is we're going to press F1 to enter into the UEFI. This is pretty much the firmware, the OS environment. Um, and what we're going to get is like our first is going to be what's called our easy interface, which gives you a lot of just the initial assessment information. Uh, but we want to get this initial information because we want to confirm a lot of just basic points of um, initialization. So right now we can check that our CPU cooling solution is working because we're idling at a very low temperature. So we can see right now it's idling at 24C. Um, so we know it's working as needed. Um, if it was actually running much hotter, one, the actual the solution that we have, which is this um, this NZXT X61 Kraken, which is a really high performance unit, the actual uh, if you probably get a shot of it on the other side, you'll see that it changes color based on the temperature. Right now it's white because it's cool, but if, let's say, the CPU was running very hot, it would be red, but we would also have this be in red. And if all of you sudden you saw 80 degrees or 85 degrees and it was red, we'd know, hey, we need to shut down the system because maybe the CPU is incorrectly mounted, uh, maybe the cooling solution needs to be firmed up, uh, the fans are connected, something is off. Here we're also connecting... Uh, excuse me, confirming our DRAM. We can see that we have 64 gigabytes of memory um, and it is all correctly registered. You can see each channel is associated. So we've got A2, uh, B1, B2, C1, C2, D1, D2. So all of those are enabled, we're good to go. Now we haven't attached our storage devices, but if you had already attached them, we can also see instant confirmation of that there. And you can even see, we give you this nice real-time live animation of the actual fans. So yeah. we even know the fans are actively spinning. So overall, this gives us a great initial kind of go ahead. Hey, keep going. Let's get everything continued, wrapped up. We're going to next uh, just finish doing a little bit more cabling. We're going to attach um, a couple more fans and then our storage devices. And then we'll start to button this up so we can actually get into the operating system and do a couple of different things. But you'll see they're all spinning much more quickly. And once now it's going to happen, it'll start to modulate the speed for every single fan. And you'll actually hear the system keep getting quieter. Like you hear it just got a little bit quieter and it's going to keep getting quieter because it's going through the calibration process for every single one of these fans right now that are installed on there. Huh. And it'll keep toning down, it'll keep toning down, you'll actually eventually get to the point that the fan will even stop because it's measuring each points of the fan. And then we can incorporate even more advanced functionality once we get in the operating system when you actually install the program that lets you to manage all this. But even for users, you know, some users don't always want to run our software. Um, there's a lot of value functionality in there. Huh. but. Stop. Yeah, because now it's it's figured out, oh, I know what the minimum curve is for there. And so it's going through. This one you can also see it's actually stopped here. The CPU one is left that it's running through. But it'll keep going through. And then at the end, it'll even give you a little report on screen really. that shows you, hey, this is what the minimum fan curve is. And that's actually really useful information because each fan is actually different. Yeah, these have also already, they've gone through calibration. But the CPU fans won't ever go fully silent gotcha. because, of course, it's cooling the CPU. Gotcha. So the actual tuning that even you do, you can literally hear inside the UEFI real time. So it's just like actually doing it in the operating system, mm -hmm. but we can do it even real time here, which is cool because like when you're first going through your setup, if you kind of want to mess around with it a little bit before you even get in the OS and configure everything, you can kind of get a sense of the way things might work or might tune out because you can dynamically go in and you can adjust those those parameters. And like here, this is where I was also talking about where you see like the input sources where that's now, see, that's where I have all those different input sources where I can have it respond to. Okay. So instead of having, let's say, that chassis fan one respond to the CPU, I could have it respond to that motherboard temperature. I could have it respond to the VRM, which is the top part of the motherboard where it has the heat sinks, or the PCH, which is the lower part, which tends to drive all your storage performance. Or these, uh, these three right there, those are the thermosistors. So those are the ones where, like, wherever you placed those, that's where it would respond to the temperature. You buy the same drives. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if you have like four two terabyte hard drives. Well, how do you know which drive is for which purpose? So you can go in though. Give yeah, and you can actually, mm -hmm. you, can, you can see that I can rename each port. Awesome. So if I want Windows, and then the second one is, that's my, yeah, my media drive, the second one, yeah, exactly. So even in the BIOS nice. or the UEFI, you know which drives are connected to what. So if you had to remove that drive, yeah or if you were doing anything, you know which drives you're working on because normally all you're gonna see is just a model number versus where in Windows you actually see the names. We developed, it was called five-way optimization and pretty much what it does is it has a couple of, excuse me, uh, can I borrow your mouse pen? No, go right yeah. has, um, it has five different points of functionality. So right here, 
Um, here's the button, which is single touch option, but we have TPU, which is uh, essentially for adjusting all the frequency or performance related functions of the system. So if you were to go into that, this is where it allows you to essentially do overclocking, but dynamically in the operating system, you could adjust the frequency of each core, uh, you could do all core clocking, meaning all the cores would run at a single speed. You could make all the adjustments. But the truth is, <clears throat> for most users, this can still be fairly complex. They might not really know what mm, the values of adjustment are available to them, right? Um, here, the fan expert, that one's up pretty easy. What that does is that's that fan calibration technology, yeah. but with the full advanced layers of, of usability that we have now within the OS as compared to the still pretty cool functionality we had in that UEFI or that BIOS, but now we can do a lot more. So you, are you controlling everything that you'd normally control in the BIOS, but you're doing within Windows 8.1? Yeah, well, you, you even have this functionality right now under Windows 7 with our system utility because the kind of tricky thing for people to understand is while this is software, we have hardware mechanisms that are literally built onto the board that allow for that communication to occur. So it's really more so this is a GUI to interface directly with the hardware. Okay. So it's just an easier way for you to manage hardware, but from within the OS environment. Uh, in the past, you used to have actually true software-based implementations that had to use what's called a GPIO driver. It's kind of complex, but pretty much what they did is they had software mechanisms that tried to simulate commands that would try to initialize. But there are things here that when you actually execute them through here, when you reboot, or even if you were to remove the software, those functions or those settings would still be applied mm -hmm. because it's actually applying them on a hardware level. Um, here we've got our Digi Plus power management settings. This allows you to do a lot of uh, control option to what's called the VRM. Now VRM is a really technical part, but there's really interesting things that you can do. Like I just give you some kind of general knowledge about it. So like this thing right here, it says power face control, right? Where you have like standard, optimized, extreme. Well, optimize, you have what's called a, a phase, which is made of a, an inductor, a, uh, the inductor, the, the driver, and the MOSFET. So that comes together to actually create this, this power portion for the CPU. Well, we can control the ability on how the phase actually works. So if let's say, let's say you set it to like extreme, all these phases, so this motherboard has some very, very, very high quality phases on here. Uh, they provide a lot of power output. They'll run at 100% all out 100% of the time. So they, they can provide a very high level amperage output capability so to power the CPU if you were to overclock it. But of course, if you're running something at 100%, even though that's giving you a great deal of power output, what does that probably produce? It produces a higher power consumption marker and more th heat because the actual inductor is running at, a, a, it's essentially running full bore. Right. Um, so of course at stock, that wouldn't be sensible, but like if you're heavily overclocking, you would maybe want to enable that setting, right? So we can go in and we can conditionally control those things. Like our optimized value actually works off a of load. Depending on the load that's requested by the CPU, it can dynamically go from like two phases to four phases to six phases to eight phases, and it can dynamically drop up and down. So that's like a really great balance of like efficiency to performance. But this, all these type of controls, they're available to the user. They can go in there and they can manipulate that. But we have what are called auto rules. So auto rules are already built in logic into the board that if you make certain, uh, like uh, uh, let's say parameters of adjustment, the board automatically sets a lot of these things for you. So you don't ever really have to do it. This is just for that demographic of users that like to have manual control and they'd like to be able to kind of tweak and tune it, you know? But it's pretty crazy that you have that level of control and granularity available to you. Um, if we go back though, this is where I really think this is pretty cool. This app um, has, is newly introduced for this generation. So I'm just gonna open up Cinebench just as an example for like a reference for you to get an idea of kind of how it works. Um, but uh, when we open up this program, but got this tracking. There we go. What we can do is we can refresh it. So imagine that's like a you know some some application. That's, that could be Premiere, it could be Blender, it could be Lightroom, it could be whatever. Okay. So I now have this little program here, and I can click on this, right. and this allows me to set parameters of performance per each application. Whoa. So what that means is right here, this means it runs default, it runs stock, right? right? But if I click user. I can actually tell it what I want. So if I were to click this, you see how all the cores now have frequencies? Uh -huh. If I want that program to run at, let's say, 4.8 gigahertz, right. right, then I can set it to run at that. And then on top of that, we have uh, profiles that I get associated with the program. So we have special audio profiles. We worked with the DTS Sound Group on creating customized waveforms for music, movies, and games. Uh -huh. So let's say you open up 
you know, you're watching a movie and you're watching it in VLC, right? Well, maybe you want that to be in movie mode. So automatically when you open up the program, it'll automatically adjust the EQ to the movie preset that we developed. The LAN, let's say this was a game for instance, or maybe yeah. you're um, or like Media Code in Premiere allows you to upload to YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, maybe you actually always want the NIC prioritization to be high. Uh, so you could set it to be high. And then even fan profile, let's say this was your web browser instead. Well, if you're surfing the internet or you're checking your email, do you need all the fans being active? No. Right, so you could set it to silent and after we do the fan calibration, you could do that. Now the powerful thing about this, that's just one program. Imagine applying a customized profile to Premiere, to your web browser, to every program. And that means that when I go from just literally one program to another program, it dynamically switches. What happens if I have like a web browser open? And you have another Premiere. one. So it works off of a prioritization scale. So if you have concurrent programs, the primary program that's in the foreground receives the prioritization. So if you see, if I add another one, it will then take on the value of being the second program. And you can drag and drop these. So you can you can define the priority if, if you want to, wow. let's say, have that one be the first one or the second one. That's cool. But that's a really advanced way of customizing. Like most people don't think about that because they think of their system running essentially uh, the same level of functionality all the time, all the time for yeah, every program. Yeah. But we don't need our programs to run that way, especially for some programs that take advantage of one kind of level of functionality compared to another. Like Lightroom, like I told you, it's really only well suited for one or two threads. So you'd much rather have it run very high frequency on two threads, but then like when you go into Premiere, Premiere can use all your threads. So you maybe run it at a lower frequency, but on all cores. So like four gigahertz on all cores, versus like when you're in Lightroom, it runs at 4.6 gigahertz, but only on two cores. Wow. So saving. You can go in and you can customize a lot of these things. You can set exactly when you want the system's monitor to shut off, when you want it to sleep. Um, you can even, con you, even if you wanted to, you can underclock your CPU so that if you wanted to consume far less power yeah, um, yeah. under certain scenarios, right? Yeah, yeah. Then you could go ahead and do that. It's, it's, very, it's very customizable in terms of what we give the ability. So like right here, this is where you see like add on USB controller. Uh -huh. So see, disable power to the USB ports when there's no connected devices. Why should we be powering that port if there's nothing that's actually connected to yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah. Or disable it when the device, you know, safely removed. You got, you know, you can go in there. There's, there's a lot of really cool little options like that that are built in. But this is kind of the big focal one. So this is all end user customizable, but some of that can be really complex. So what we did here with this TPU technology is we have this four gigahertz. So somebody like yourself, you know, you only built your system recently. You're not probably really an overclocker. You don't really know. But let's say you bought, that's a perfect example. You got actually a very good power supply in there. You got a great motherboard. Yeah. You I had an overclockable processor. I overclocked it. Oh, okay. So yeah. you, okay. So. Um, I mean, I went through the whole procedures of like having it do its thing over and over again. You oh, so you did use, you use the auto-tuning. Yeah. I'll say that's great. So we I actually. I tried to do it myself and I just gave up. My, I went back to auto-tuning. So that's actually a great example. So compared to that generation though, we've made a huge amount of more advancements. So for this generation, um, we have a lot of customization. So you can tune in two ways. You can do all core tuning or you can do per core tuning. Now per core tuning is a better option. The reason being is that a lot of overclockers focus on all core overclocking. And the disadvantage of that is that you leave generally megahertz on the floor mm -hmm. uh, because the margin of the CPU isn't always to all cores. You know, you might have four cores that can achieve far greater frequency just on those four cores versus all cores might be at a more limited frequency. So an example, four cores could hit 4.6 gigahertz, right? And even maybe two cores could get to 4.8 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And then all cores could only get to like 4.3 gigahertz, right. right? But if you did all core overclocking and you ran your stability at all core, then you've artificially limited yourself to 4.3 on every core. Right. So you left tons of megahertz on the table. Interesting. So Very that, interesting. that's why we do per core clocking because we realize the value that we can tune the CPU wow. to sometimes give us greater margin on just conditional cores, which is also the way real world programs work because most actually programs aren't like content creation programs. They're not multi-threaded aware. They tend to only be optimized for one to maybe two threads. Wow. So like your web browser, it's predominantly single threaded. It gets the best performance from actually single frequency. Okay. Um, you know, uh, like Outlook, Outlook is two thread optimization. You know, it's a, it just depends on the program, but most programs, so per core tuning is very important because you get much better performance based on that. Um, and then we have a couple of other options. So what we've done is uh, like at this point, we've analyzed about 400 MP production CPUs. Mm -hmm. So we ascertain kind of what the margin is. 
So what we found out is, take for instance this is CPU that you're purchased that we have here, right? If you were to buy it, the 5960X, its base frequency is three gigahertz. Its maximum frequency under under Intel spec is 3.3. Um, but we found that pretty much every extreme CPU will hit at a minimum at least 40 to 41. So that means built in is it has a guaranteed headroom of about four gigahertz or a little bit over that. Um, then there's the next percentage of CPUs, probably about 80% of them will be able to hit between 42 to as much as 44. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the next set. Uh, from there, when you get to about the 44 to 46, that's probably only 25% of CPUs can hit that frequency range. And then beyond that, it's a very, it's sub 10%. So there will be a percentage of CPUs that will even be able to do 4.7 or 4.8. But you have to remember, this is, we're talking 16 threads. This is a huge amount of frequency and cores and, yeah. and everything to be running at that much higher frequencies. Um, but what we did find is that previously, our auto voltage of 1.3 volts. So we won't go over 1.3 volts when we overclock. The reason why we do that is because we've tested to see what's the type of thermal load that that puts on there, what's the type of overclocking range that that voltage will provide to us, and we feel that's the best balance of giving you good scaling, so allowing the CPU to get to a certain frequency. Um, also, it works in tandem that the majority of coolers that are gonna be in this segmentation can adequately dissipate that increased level of voltage. So it's a, it's a realistic scenario. And one other big thing is we use a form of adapt, uh, voltage um, control that's called an adaptive voltage. This is really, really, really cool because historically, uh, if I open up, like I'll open up a program here and I'll kind of give you an example of what I mean. A um, lot of overclockers, when they overclock, there's actually three different types of voltage policies. Um, the most common one is what's referred to as a static or a absolute or a manual voltage. The disadvantage with the static or a manual voltage though is, is that it's fixed. So that means regardless of whatever you're doing, it, whether you're just idling purely at the desktop or you have a web browser open or you're doing rendering, doesn't matter what you're doing, the voltage that you've defined stays 100% the same. So you can realize how that's very inefficient because you're not, you're consuming more power, you're producing more heat, uh, you're artificially driving more voltages to the CPU than it needs at the time. Um, and this even over time can cause what's called voltage conditioning and voltage degradation, but that's a, you know, some other kind of steps into it. What um, what is now available to us is what is called an adaptive voltage policy, which is really, really cool. The CPU, when it's in its standard or stock operating parameter, the voltage will entirely drop down. So if you run at stock, 100% drops down to pure Intel operating spec. And only when it gets into the overclock range does it actually apply an additional voltage that's required for that higher frequency. So you get that best of kind of both worlds environment. If you're not doing much on your system and your system's just idling, the CPU frequency and the voltage come all the way down, giving you very, very low power consumption. You know, you get reduced thermal load, you get great uh, voltage conditioning because you're not artificially driving more voltage to the CPU. But the moment you jump into a program and the frequency goes up, then the voltage also goes up in line with it at the same time. And that's how we also choose to overclock as opposed to a lot of users when they manually do it themselves, they're gonna use that manual method we're using the most advanced, best mechanism to overclock for you so that you get that really great balance of efficiency, but also complementing the performance to, to be able to uh, sustain the overclock that you need to. So, um, Does it make that much of a difference? Uh, it, in our evaluation, when we've done testing, we found that generally it, it does not. The, the cores, the CUDA cores, have a much bigger impact than the frequency of the cores, but it is somewhat conditionally specific that we have seen that um, with, G with the architecture, especially for NVIDIA based graphics cards, they have something that's called power target utilization. So when you overclock the card, if you don't have sufficient power target available, you may not actually be fully, you may, you may not fully actually be using that overclocked frequency. So it's a little bit complicated. You have to be able to monitor that the card is still working within the power envelope that it allows that overclock to exercise itself. Uh, in situations that the power target is still open or essentially still free to leverage the overclock, we have found that it can improve performance, but it won't improve performance as much as CUDA cores. Um, but with that noted, you still have a kind of a limitation. Eventually, once you get to a certain class of GPU, generally jumping up to a higher and higher GPU, even with more CUDA cores, has a diminishing effect on the performance that it will offer in rendering.
Yeah, if we if we ran it without the AVX, it would be probably like I said about it tends to be about a hundred to two hundred megahertz higher mm -hmm. without AVX because it's less taxing, so you get a little bit more frequency. Okay. Uh -huh. But right now, what it's occurring is it's doing it in the OS where it's dynamically going through that fan calibration process. So it's just going through and uh, going through each one of the fans and calibrating them for their minimum, their maximum, and it's storing all those values. So okay. four point three gigahertz overclock that we've enabled, right? we can still see that we're giving you that great effective um, idle performance, right? So you can see it still drops down to that 1.2, but you can see still the voltage drops down all the way down to its Intel stock parameters. So you get that great balance that now if all of a sudden we were to still jump into, let's say, you know, like our Cinebench, like you remember from last time, if we were to fully load that, of course we look at the voltage. course it's going to put the CPU under load and you see in the moment that it senses the load now the frequencies jumped up to 4.3 and the voltage has jumped up to 1.3 and you can see of course it's completing the renders a lot more quickly even than before which was already very very quick Interesting. and then the moment it's done because we're using that adaptive voltage like we talked about that dynamically will change and it drops down so yep you see how it finished the workload and then just drop back down. System Suite, because okay. AI Suite 3 also has things like, uh, like we have a quick charging support on USB ports. So like if you have like a phone or like a tablet and you it want to, to up the current. Yeah, exactly. We can quick charge even like when the system gets turned off, if you want to quick charge those ports. Or we've got like our USB 3 boost, which can optimize the USB 3 performance. There's a lot of other functions that we built in. Those are all part of the full AI Suite 3 system utility. Okay. But the dual intelligent processors 5, that is a specific portion. The fiber optimization is a specific part of AI Suite 3. So we run through actually a lot of different things. So you can see like we do blurring and stretching yeah. and soft glows and uh. all kinds of stuff that like you would actually do, you know, if you yeah, were yeah, yeah. if you were doing, you know, normal workflow. Um, but we we tried to that's why we call it a real bench, because we feel like we tried to provide real applications. Um, and we're trying to work on a version of this that's even specific for Adobe, but it's a little bit more complicated because yeah. Adobe is a paid for program. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we did, we decided to do this first version at least with free open source applications. Like yeah, exactly. Which they're still representative of what you would do in those same workloads, you know? Um, but the cool thing is this all gets applied and we run through these things. And like I said, and you go through the scores, um, but here we can get an idea, like I said, of, you know, if we were keeping track of temperatures, which we can also do within the utility, but we can actually see how much, but you can see this image editing stuff. We're running at the frequency and it doesn't even, it's worth like you're running, you know, you haven't even gotten beyond yet like 53 degrees. So wow. um, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome in terms of the, the performance. System runs and there definitely is. I think the most important thing to kind of keep in mind is that when people historically kind of evaluate Windows 7 to Windows 8, they first in Windows 8 just think about the live tile system, right? So they generally kind of just, I don't have actually a lot of them here installed right here, but this is what they think about. They think about this live tile screen um, as opposed to a lot of the changes that Microsoft made underneath the hood. And when we talk about a workstation, when we talk about a platform that's built for content creation, Windows 8 actually has a lot of things that are inherently built in that give you much better performance. So um, one of the first ones is storage performance. Um, both storage performance for just general SATA-based devices or any AHCI-based devices will generally have better optimization. Microsoft worked to actually overhaul the kernel to be able to provide better response and better performance. So the latest generation of SATA devices, whether they're SSDs, M.2-based SSDs, anything along those lines is one going to get better performance. Um, but on the storage side as well, for external-based performance like USB 3.0, there's significant improvements. New platforms, like especially this one that we've built a system off X99, feature uh, the latest generation of USB 3.0 controllers, which support something that's called UASP. Excuse me, uh, UASP versus uh, older-based implementations like in Windows 7, which are referred to as BOT. Now, ultimately, what this just comes down to is that one is a much newer protocol that's more efficient and more dynamic at transfer performance. So when you talk about copying files over from one device to another, uh, whether it's going to be like a high-speed uh, USB external flash drive, this one like here, we've got a, a Mushkin Ventura Ultra, which is actually a USB-enabled flash drive. We can get under Windows 8 450 megabytes read and write performance out of this drive. Um, that's only achievable under Windows 8 because it has support for that. Um, so I think that's a big plus to content creators and people that want to be able to transfer disks 
externally or work with high-speed external SSD enclosures and things along those lines. Also, um, we can see here on our desktop, you have a lot more control over how you can work with file transfers. We can see here we actually started to transfer over quite a number of different files and uh, the task manager system and the actual transfer manager that's built in is very robust. You can actually do prioritization, pausing, um, and you also support queuing. Queuing is very important because that means that actually you can have multiple transfers occur but without them slowing down. So you can see right here I started a transfer, I'm just going to go ahead and click play. Uh, and that's essentially resume. So now it's going to continue that transfer. But if I want to, I could also go ahead and click on that one. And it's going to go ahead and continue that transfer as well. If I wanted to go ahead and have one complete before the other, then of course I could go ahead and click pause. Um, but all these things and a lot more are just not available to you in the Windows 7 OS. You then also take other improvements that they've done within the actual flyer, uh, file explorer system itself where you have a lot easier ability to be able to go ahead and copy and move files, rename, and pretty much just access everyday functions that you would traditionally use as I think as a content creator and they're built in. Uh, when you pair that in, that overall the system posts faster, it boots more quickly, it resumes more quickly, it hibernates more quickly and you get general better performance in pretty much all key categories plus optimization for newer hardware like multi-threaded processors um, and the kind of the current architecture that's currently in our systems. I think it's definitely a platform. So outside of what you have to deal with in just the live live desktop or live tiles. There's a whole lot there in terms of the performance. So that is, that's that. that Six gig, but what right. does that translate in terms of and, meg and megabytes, megabyte. pretty much the wall has already been reached by any high performance current generation SSD, which is approximately about 550 megabytes. You can't, at that point, you've saturated the peak sequential throughput performance. So the things that I'm getting off of the um, the speed test, which yes. is, that's not really a really good indication because it's coming off RAM. Or Correct. It, yes, it's so a, it's, really it's, not, it's not coming off through this entire pipe. Correct. It's yeah. a it's an approximation because what that's doing is it's measuring the performance for that device. But since that device has been linked to also uh, receive a performance improvement from memory that's been uh, that it's being paired through the application. So when that is either receiving a read or write request at the same time it's working in tandem with memory. So therefore that's increasing its number. But if you were to turn off that, then you would find that the maximum number that it can yield would be no higher than 550 megabytes. Okay. That's the highest level of throughput that's offered. That's where the M.2 based interface or the SATA Express interface can offer much higher throughput because its peak throughput is 10 gigabits. So it can offer a significantly higher sequential ceiling. But it is important to remember that if you look at total SSD performance such as IOPS, so the instructions per second, as well as 4K performance, which is much more representative of normal desktop performance, that number is significantly below the peak sequential performance of the SATA interconnect, right? Because if you look at your 4K performance, it might be maybe 100 megabytes or 150 megabytes, yeah. or even on a very, very good drive, maybe let's say 200, 250 megabytes. That's still half of what the actual peak throughput is. So there is still a lot of room for controllers and architecture to still continue to improve. But if we just talk about pure highest end sequential throughput that's achievable, at this point we have already saturated the SATA 6G bus. This is why we have now implemented new types of interconnects, namely M.2 as well as SATA Express or even PCIe. Um, of course, you can buy PCIe native SSDs that plug into a PCI Express graphics slot. And some of those can actually offer one gigabyte, two gigabytes, even three gigabytes of max sequential read and write performance.